All right, so I just put the blade back in. It's we're doing the final hardening now. So I let the, the oven come back up to 1500 and I put the blade in. Of course that drops it down. So I'm going to take a few minutes here to let the blade uh let the oven come back up to 1500 and as soon as it does, I'm going to hit start on my timer for 7 minutes and I'm going to let it soak for 7 minutes and then we're going to quench it here and uh I'll show you what that what I'm using for so my quench in here for 1084 is uh, Parks 50. You can get that at MaximOil.com. I don't think you can get it on their, I, don't, I think it's on their website. I think you actually have to call them or email them uh, and they'll send it to you. I use Parks 50 for 1084 and then I use McMaster Car um, 11 second oil, which is on my table over here in another container. And then I've got a, a bucket with uh, basically kitty litter. So I'll I'll quench and then I'll go into the kitty litter to kind of get some of the oils and stuff like that off of. And then as soon as I'm done with that, as soon as it's quenched, while it's still warm, I'm going to take, I'm going to get as much of the crust off of, of it as I can and I'm going to do a flash temper in my tempering oven at uh, 350 while it's still, while it's still warm. That's not my final tempering temperature, it's just a flash temper. Flash. All right, here we go. Moving quickly as I can. Be careful not to hit it on anything. You definitely don't want to hit it side to side. You want to be careful that you don't bang the tip around. If I had a bigger quench tank, it wouldn't flame up at all because the only part that flames up is the part that's exposed. And I like to agitate kind of up and down. You definitely don't want to agitate side to side because that puts uh, you know horizontal loads on the steel and you can get warpage that way. But you definitely don't want to leave the steel sitting in exactly one spot. So you can move it you know, back and forth across the edge and the spine or you can go up and down because whenever you leave it in one spot that can tend to form a gas pocket uh, around the steel and create a barrier between the steel and the oil and the oil won't dissipate your heat as well so you want to kind of agitate some if you can you just want to make sure that you don't bang it around on stuff and that pinging that you're hearing is not the steel that is the satanite and the uh, anti-scaling compound breaking off. You can see it's already kind of starting to flake off there. Can you see that? That's just with my finger right there. The anti-scaling compound just kind of breaking off of there. That happens because, you see that right there, whenever your steel goes from, whenever you're at the critical temperature, you're at a portion called austenite. Whenever you quench it, the shock of that creates the formation of martensite, which is the hardened steel, which you want. That transformation process blows that scale off of there and blows the same thing. It blows off that hardening, the, uh, the anti-scaling compound. See how clean and shiny that steel is? If I had not put this satanite on here and just did the whole thing with an anti-scaling compound, when it came out of the steel, when it came out of the quench, it would just be as shiny as it can be. It's awesome, awesome stuff. So that's still pretty warm, but it's touchable now. So now I'll go into the kitty litter here. Get the excess quench off. You gotta be careful because the tang didn't go in the oil very much, so you gotta be careful with it. It's still pretty hot. And if it's too hot, you might want to go back into your oil until it cools down because you don't want that heat running into your edge, which it is a little bit. So I'm gonna go back into my oil for just a minute. I'm gonna go ahead and get that tang cooled down just a little bit. 
because I don't want that residual heat to run into my edge and ruin everything that I just did. probably about 150 degrees, but that's still hot, but that's well below my tempering temperature, so I'm still in a good situation here, no problem. Alright, so now that I've got the oil off of here, I've got just a, a square file here. Sometimes you don't even need it, and you can just break off that satanite. It just comes right off. See that? You be careful doing this, you don't want to break it, but I'm just tapping on that safe knife to break it loose. And there we go. Alright. So this way, and just to check, if you're wondering, this is just a rudimentary test, but just to see if we've got hardened at the edge, I'll take this file. Hear that? You don't get much harder than that. Based on my testing that I've done with my Rockwell tester on the test pieces, we should be at about 64 to 65 on this hardened steel right here. Probably back up in the 50s and maybe the high 40s back here along the tang and spine, which is where we want. So now I'm going to take this whole thing just as you see it and I'm going to do a flat, I'm going to try to get as much of this stuff off as I can around the edge and I'm going to go do a flash temper real quick at 350 degrees for about an hour. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it out of the tempering oven, I'm going to boil up some water and I'm going to get the rest of this crud off of there. Okay, so this is my tempering setup. This is a, basically a $50, 50 or $60 toaster oven that I got from Walmart probably, I don't know, eight years ago, something like that. And I still use this to this day for my tempering. I do have an, a, an even heat kiln that I use for my hardening process and I thought that it was going to make this obsolete for my tempering, but I found out that it did not. And the reason being is because the, the particular kiln that I have is not very accurate at lower temperatures like it is at higher temperatures. But at the same time, it's very difficult to control the temperature inside there. Um, it, it's very easy for that thing to ramp up 20 or 30 degrees or sometimes 50 degrees when those uh, elements fire up. This thing is, and I would just, I was overcooking and over tempering my blades when I started tempering with it. Talked to a buddy of mine that has one. He said, oh yeah, I don't use that for, for tempering either. I, I just use a toaster oven mainly because it's more controllable. Now, these toaster ovens do have a little bit of a bad rap in terms of some of the things that, some of the characteristics of them when it comes to tempering. Um, but, but there are some things that you can do to correct it and I'll show you that. So the first thing is, the bottom line is the tech... The, the way these things are built is exactly the same way that those high-priced uh, furnaces are built. The difference is, it's basically, it's a metal container with a, a digital controller and a set of firing elements that heat up the inside, which is exactly the way those even heat, or any of the, any of the Paragons, any of the heat treating ovens, it's the exact same way that they work. This is just a much scaled down version. The biggest problem with these is because they're just a thin metal box, they're not very insulated and they don't hold their temperatures very well and there's big variations in the temperatures inside these things but there are ways around that as you can see in the back there I've got a big fire brick in the back of it and I also have a, a metal grilling tray sitting here that's covering up the the bottom heating element so it doesn't affect the blade and then I have this uh, fire brick Basically, you know, I don't know what they call those things. Basically, the holders, a tray, or whatever you call it, that basically holds the blade. So I'm going to temper this thing now in here. And what that fire brick in the back does is that it regulates the temperature 
inside this oven. So what happens is once this thing gets up to temperature, whenever the temperature starts to drop, then these elements here, they'll fire. Well, the problem with that is, is that because your blade is so close to it, it can actually over, overheat the air that's in here. Now, the, the probe for the computer is over in this area, uh, and it doesn't necessarily read as accurately. If you can see it, it's up there in that corner. Well, it may only be 420 degrees up there, but right here in the area around those elements, it may actually be a lot higher, and you'll actually over temper your blade not realizing it. So again, the fire brick in the back, what that does is it, reg it regulates the temperature inside this oven so that once this thing actually gets up to temperature, these elements barely work at all at that point because the temperature is pretty much self-sustaining. The other thing that I did is I don't use the temperature that's here at all. I have a separate thermocoupler that I bought and I use this inside my even heat as well and it's just got this this thermal probe this wire probe and I drilled a hole lift up this in the top of this um, oven where that probe goes down into and as you can see I've got the top of this and the back of this oven covered with this insole all of that is designed to keep the temperature as locked in in this thing as possible and as you can see that probe here unlike the probe that's up here in the corner the probe that I'm using is only about an inch and a half above the blade so I'm measuring the temperature as close to the blade as I can at all times so I get a more accurate read on my temper now here's the cool thing about this setup is unlike the heat the even heat kiln when I use that you can't really open the door and regulate it at all whatever is going on inside there it, it, it is what it is but with this setup here here's what I use I'll set this about 20 or 30 degrees above where I need it so if I'm tempering at 450 or I'm sorry at about 400 I'll actually set this at about 4, 425 it only it maxes out at 450 anyway but what I do is if you notice this little glass door I open it almost an inch and then I pull this insole wool down here to block that off to seal that opening what this allows me to do is is as the the, the tempering cycle is going on if I notice on my uh, thermo gauge here that the temperature is rising too much all I have to do is use my finger here and create a couple of vents and that will bring the air temperature down slowly inside around my blade and then as the temperature starts to fall if it starts to get a little bit below the temperature that I want then I'll drop that insole wool back down cover up the gaps the temperature will go back up so that's how I temper my blades this is a small oven, but I can fit it. I've, fit, I've tempered as many as 10 small blades in there, and I can get up to five or six of these larger buoys. I would, that's, that's a pretty large buoy there. I think it's the whole thing is about 16 inches from tang to tip there, and it has no problem fitting in there. I could fit two or three more in there at least. So this is a pretty good setup. Again, it seems kind of backwoods to do it this way, but the reality is it actually gives me a lot of control and if I feel like I've under tempered something well, that's okay I can always go back and temper it a little bit more but once you over temper something you're done you pretty much have to start the whole heat treating process from scratch so uh, give it a shot see what you think about it one thing I will remind you I'm gonna go ahead and temper this and I'll save you the I'll save you the trouble of watching that you definitely want to make sure that you're just like I do with my my heat treating oven that when I'm tempering, I make sure that my oven is up to temp before I put the blade in there. Now, I know I put it in here just to show you, but I'm not going to have the blade in there while this is coming up to temp. The main reason is because those elements right there, they don't really have multiple gears. They're basically all or nothing. When they fire, they're firing full blast. I do not want the air above and around my blade to get up above the tempering temperature while the whole temperature inside the container is trying to catch up. I don't want that. So I'll take this blade out of here, fire up the oven, let it come up to temp real good, 
then I'll open the door and put my blade in. So that's how I do my tempering. Hope that helps you out. All right, so now here you'll see what we have left on here. This, the black part that's here is the, the non-scaling compound that did not blow off during the quench. So why did it not blow off? Well, the, uh, the satanite has all been flaked off. That's all, that's all gone. All that's left is the residue of the non-scaling compound. So why did it not come off? Well, remember, the tang and all along through here is where I put the satanite. Like I said, whenever you get the, t the blade to critical temp, austentite forms. Whenever you quench, austentite converts over to martensite. And that process is very, um, well, it's a big shock. It's, it's a huge jolt. You can actually feel the blade vibrating in the oil when that happens. This area here is the part that was exposed. It reached critical temperature, so when I quenched it, martensite formed. That means hardened steel, soft steel. This area through here did not convert to martensite because it never achieved critical temp because of the satanite coating that was there. I'm still going to take this a step further. We're going to do a torch, uh, a slight torch uh, draw of the tang and the spine. But for the most part, this is all hardened steel through here, and this is all soft. Now, it looks a little nasty at the moment, but I assure you this will come off very easily with just a pot of boiling water. It basically just kind of melts off with just a bare minimum of cleaning. I, I have one of those really fine, small um, wire brushes, and I dip it in the boiling water, and I just kind of scrape it off, and it literally will just melt and fall into the bottom of the, of the pot that you use. So here's where we're at. So now I'm going to save you that process, so when we come back, I'll have this all cleaned up. Alright, a little boiling water. Dip it in there for a few minutes and that anti-scaling compound just kind of boils right off of there. So the next step will be get some 400 grit sandpaper and clean this up a little bit. And it'll be time to do the soft back draw. And I'll show you the process that I use to do that. It's pretty simple. Okay, so we've got our blade fully hardened, fully tempered to about a 59 Rockwell and I want to do one last step with this. I know I differentially heat treated this and I know that I you know, I use satanite on this but I just want to make sure that I don't have any residual hardness in this tang or the ricasso because I don't want any of this to break off. This is a bigger buoy. might be used for some chopping and I don't want this thing to have any weak spots in it. So I'm going to take care of that by hand with a propane torch. The other thing if you notice I haven't drilled this tang. The reason is, is I like to do that towards the end of the whole process just before I start working on the handle because when I profile this and I finish grinding I might make a mistake somewhere or I may not be happy with the profile and if I've already got my tang drilled I'm kind of locked into where that pinhole is and I may want to adjust my handle shape at some point so I want to hold off on that. So what I've got here is a three inch deep stainless steel, uh, I don't know exactly what it is but I got it, it's a big uh, deep dish pan that I got from a chef supply store and it's got sand and water in it and what this is going to do, you want to find the right balance for just enough water but not too much is I'm going to sit this blade in here and I'm going to bury up into the sand and water the hardened edge and leave just about that much exposed and what I'm going to do is now I can run my torch along here and I can do whatever I want to this the heat will not travel and ruin the temper past the water line or the sand line so it basically is a built-in protector for that so let me get my torch fired up and I'll show you how I do this I won't, I won't film the whole process but basically what I'm trying to do is I'm going to work my tang my ricasso and this top edge here through to when it turns gray again so when you work you really if you're going to be heat treating you should really do some studying on the uh, the color spectrum of steel that it goes through once it's heated um, your first step is going to be sort of a a light straw then a, then a brown then it's going to go into a, a, a purple then a blue and then from the blue it transitions back to gray so we're gonna do that blue is more of a springy steel so you can actually just do this to blue if you want to so that's actually where my ricasso is gonna be is in the blue area because I want it to have a little bit of give to it but the tang area I'm actually gonna make that as soft as possible I'm gonna get that all the way back through the spectrum to where it turns gray again but be careful make sure you're paying attention you don't want the 
this to start getting red. If you leave it in one area too long, it's going to start getting red. And if that steel starts getting red, you have the potential to have uh, some air hardness go on. And you, and you don't want that because you'll have some hard spots in your tang. We want the tang to be soft and flexible so that we can drill it. It's going to be supported by the handle material and we don't want any uh, stresses to affect that and break it off. So let's get the torch fired up. Alright, so now we've got it completely done now. This blade is fully heat treated. There will be no other heat treating steps with this. Uh, you can see with our colors here, I've got my, the tang is grayed out again like I want. That shows me that it's completely fully soft and I tested it with a file. If you can see here on the edge, it's really galled up there so it worked. You can see where this transitions into sort of a, uh, a lighter brown and, and a little bit darker straw color and along the spine I've got some blues and I've got some some browns out here as well might be a little tough to see so that's exactly what I wanted I, I wanted to really soften this up and then gradually kind of bring a little bit of softness out here and you can notice I've still got nice clean the water and the sand keeps the heat away from our tempered uh, our hardened edge out here so hope you got something out of this so I want you to see what the steps look like this is the exact same process that I use for both 1084 5160 and even 01 tool steel those are the three carbon steels that I use and uh, the, the the numbers that I use in terms of the the tempering numbers and then the hardening numbers uh, th those are all going to be different for each of those steels but I still follow the same step-by-step -step process with all of these with the soft back draw and all that I will say if it's a smaller blade like something under you know a, a five or six inch blade I don't I skip this step altogether other than the tang I don't worry about the uh, uh, satanite coating on that and I don't worry about heat treating the Ricasso and all that don't need to worry about it because it's not a heavy impact knife but anything bigger than that that might be you know baton through steel through some wood or you know something that's going to hit something like a tree or a limb or something i'm going to make sure that these these stressful areas the areas that impact that stress are are heat treated appropriately and then i've taken the appropriate steps for that so i hope you got something out of it like i said i want you to see 
what the steps look like and now I'm going to put some numbers and some steps on the board here so you can kind of if you want to jot them down or come back and reference them you can see what the steps actually look like on the board thanks a lot guys okay so I told you that I would uh, lay out all of the the steps that we went through and some of the details if you guys want to might make it a little bit easier to jot some of this down if you want to give this method a try so with that blade again remember this is 1084 the same process I use step by step with 01 and 5160. 50, uh, 01 actually is going to use the same uh, Austin tight temperatures as 1084. You will have a little bit higher temperatures using 5160 I believe. I believe it's probably about 25 degrees or more but for the most part they're, they're, they're in the same general area so you can pretty much if you're using a forge, forge can pretty much kind of stay in the same range and accomplish the same thing with all three all three steels. So first step, obviously you forge your blade. Once you forge the blade, your grain is all blown apart, so you need to normalize to start getting your grain refined. And I start out with 1600 degrees, let it cool down to black. 1550, let it cool down to black. And then again, 1500, let it cool all the way down to room temp. It's gonna be a slightly air hardened at that point, so I wanna do a moderate anneal. I don't do a full spheridized anneal. The reason for that is because the more you anneal the steel, the bigger the grain is, the harder time you're gonna have getting that grain tight again when you go to quench. So I found that about 1300 degrees, let it sit overnight in the kiln or in a box of vermiculite ashes. That'll usually get it soft enough to grind with, with some good abrasives and a good grinder. Then I grind my blade. Next thing I do, once I'm grinded and I've got the blade ground and I'm ready to start the heat treating process, start hardening, I'm going to apply my non-scaling compound. I do that at 1,000 degrees. Apply the scaling compound, let it cool all the way down to room temp. Then, once it cools down, I'll apply the Satanite knife uh, along the tang and the spine of the knife. Then I'm going to do a stress relief. I'm going to do 1,500 to black. I'm going to do 1,500 to black again then 1500 all the way down to room temp. At that point, I'm ready to start the hardening process. So I'm gonna Austin tight the blade at 1500 again for a seven minute soak, and then I'm gonna quench. I use Parks number 50. It's a seven second quench. You can use a slower quench like McMaster Carr, which is what you'll use for 5160 or 01. It's about an 11 second quenching, but you're not gonna get full hardness like you will for Parks 50. Then I'm going to do a flash temper. I wanted to I mentioned that, but I didn't really explain it, so here I'm going to explain it. It's kind of an idea that came from a book that I want to recommend that you read. It's called the Heat Treatment, Selection, and Application of Tool Steels by William E. Bryson. Chapter 5 is a vital chapter for every home heat treater to read for any kind of carbon steels. It's a chapter on D2 tool steel, but it outlines in a lot of detail the process of hardening and tempering any kind of high carbon steel it's a very very good explanation of the process and the principles well, one of the things that they talk about in there is that when you quench the steel you start so I've made this little chart over here first off let me just say what flash tempering is essentially what it is it's it's delaying the process by which the blade cools down to room temperature once I do the quench because as soon as you quench from the Austin tight temperature the steel begins to form into martensite the grain changes into that this is what you want and you want to prolong this process the problem is is once the steel cools down to room temperature as you can see as soon as I quench, the martensite conversion goes up at a steep angle and it continues until 150 degrees. That's actually the temperature range for most carbon steels where it needs to be quenched to. It does not need to be quenched all the way down to room temperature. In fact, if you get it to room temperature too fast, in a lot of, in a lot of cases, that will cause you to warpage because it's too hard on the steel. So what flash tempering does, if you notice like I mentioned in the video, I still want to get the blade into the tempering oven while it's hot to touch but not too hot but I don't want it to be too cool. The reason is the longer I can keep the blade around 150 degrees or more but below my actual tempering temperature I'll extend the martensite conversion as you'll see 
The martensite conversion still continues past 150 degrees. Once you get to 72, it basically shuts off and flatlines for the most part. Um, so what I do is I flash temper at 350 degrees for an hour. What that does is from the quench, from the moment of quench, I extend my martensite conversion by a full hour by not allowing the blade to drop below 150 degrees. And again, that 350 is actually below my actual tempering, which I'll do at 415 to 425. So I'm not in danger of over tempering my steel here. I'm just keeping it in the martensite conversion process for an extended period of time before I do my full tempering. So again, guys, I uh, hope you got a lot out of that. I appreciate the feedback. I know this video is a little bit longer, but the reality is if you're gonna if you're gonna get into knife making, if you're gonna make uh, if you're gonna really study out a process, grinding is fun, forging is fun, but the truth of the matter is if you don't get your heat treating right, you're just kind of wasting your time in this whole deal. So I uh, appreciate you guys watching. Just past 200 subscribers this week. I'm so blessed and fortunate. I appreciate all you guys checking in. I love the feedback. I will I will comment and reply to every comment as possible. Thanks for your time. We'll see you around.